Glance Technologies owns and operates Glance Pay, a disruptive mobile payment technology now live in 16 cities in Canada and about to launch in the U.S. With revenues up 664% in the last quarter, Glance Technologies has the potential to be a worldwide leader in an industry projected to grow to $1.3 trillion in three years. Glance Technologies stock symbols are GLNFF in the U.S. and GET in Canada. Find out more at glancepay.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Drew Zimmerman, Portfolio Manager at PI Financial in Vancouver. Welcome back to the show, Drew. Thanks for having me on today, Jim. The news of the week, or it seems that we have a revolving door at the White House. What kind of an impact do you see having on the markets with a different face, it seems, in every portfolio every few weeks? Yeah, it really has been a, a constant turnover uh, of, of key staff members uh, through the White House. And obviously, most recently, uh, the, Gary Cohn uh, resigning. Uh, and then this week, we had uh, the firing of Tillerson uh, so key positions um, that is, you know, the, the best reaction I've seen to it is, is just confidence the or, or the lack of confidence that the, the market is, is displaying on this turnover. And, and not because, you know, the new people coming in won't be as confident as, as the people going out. But again, it's where is Trump's policy going to go? Is he going to change it? Uh, I mean, around Tillerson, he... He came out, uh, Trump came out and blatantly said that, you know, they disagreed on Iran. Um, so what implications that may have going forward? Uh, also with the Tillerson uh, firing was, you know, does he want somebody who's more aligned to start uh, a, a trade war? Or, and we've seen that with the news of, of tariffs over the last several weeks. And, you know, will it build up and, and become a full trade war? So in that environment, uh, speaking about just the general equity markets, it, it creates a, a lack of confidence. You know, how do you fully invest yourself in an environment where you're not sure if, you know, maybe a, a company that you're about to invest in will be adversely uh, affected by either tariffs on their input uh, goods or their output goods or a trading partner or retaliatory uh, measures that will be taken against a key product that that company is producing. So it's easy to, to see how you would have a, a lack of confidence at each company level. And of course, that feeds through to the financial indices uh, that we see. And, and, and again, just that sort of lack of confidence to be able to, you know, almost be fully invested or, or to, to really have the confidence to, uh, take on the risk of the equity investments, uh, especially given some of the choppy action that we've seen through, uh, February. And, and, and then at the same time, you know, we've, we've got the interest rate market moving higher and, and, uh, you know, a, a new Fed chair coming in that is looking to tighten policy. So uh, with uncertainty on the fiscal side and tightening uh, most likely on the uh, monetary side, it's it's a, a tricky environment at the moment. Well, seeing as how it's so tricky, are people taking money off the table and just waiting to see what's happening? The, we, we have seen money flow out of certain areas. Uh, I, I wouldn't say there's been a, uh, a mass exodus uh, of you know, equity investments either. And, and I think that's, that's prudent. Uh, I, I don't think you need to be fully invested at this time, but at the same time, you don't necessarily want to be underinvested. We do have some good economic readings uh, that are coming out in the United States. Uh, throughout Europe as well, uh, some of the Chinese data uh, has has surprised uh, most recently last night. Uh, so there there are signs where you know the economy can continue to do well. So you, you don't want to be underinvested. Uh, you just want to be cautious. And of course, 
I come uh, at it from a slightly different angle. Rather than having a portfolio of stocks, I trade in the futures and options market. So I'm I'm able to be uh, a little bit more tactical or um, maneuverable in my positioning on a on a very short notice. So uh, that's the way that that I would approach it. Is is just uh, cautious and 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 ready to you know have my view changed uh, quickly if need be. Do clients ask you what to do? Because, I mean, they must have certain political views and, and also they have certain views on how the market works. Has this changed the way things are done? Uh, again, I would come back to the confidence uh, measure where, you know, I, I, I come at markets from a, a top-down approach. Uh, I look at or try and assess the you know macro view of of what I think is going on. I create a market theme um, that I think is you know key to what's going on across the markets that I trade. So uh, the nuance, I guess, that that Trump has brought in is 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 that unpredictability, and that unpredictability does uh, go back to erode confidence. So when I you know talk to clients about certain investments that that they have or that they want to make, we can rationalize, you know, why that would be a a good investment. However, on top of that, now you have to have a a what if or a a bigger uh, what if scenario if Trump comes out and and says something or does something or, you know, starts a a trade war that all of a sudden uh, impacts uh, in, in a large way. What you had, you know, fully thought through as a very plausible investment plan before can get, you know, turned upside down in a moment or an announcement or a tweet knowing Trump. So, uh, it, it's again coming back to that confidence, but also, you know, having your, what well, maybe before was your standard investment plan and, and now just adding a bigger sort of what if scenario on the side because again, if something does go uh, off the rails from what you were thinking, you've got to have a plan in place to deal with that as well. You don't want to just be uh, caught like a deer in the headlights. So uh, a little bit less confidence, which is never a bad thing. That just goes to risk and sizing uh, and the way that you control that. But again, having sort of a, a plan in place for, you know, what if something else happens? What if Trump surprises the market? Uh, just having that kind of contingency plan in place. Is this a case of diversification is your best defense? Uh, I, I, I always question what people view as diversification. Is that, you know, well, I've got tech stocks and then I've got, you know, consumer cyclical stocks and then I've got uh, commodity stocks maybe. Um, but are you all in stocks? And uh, the diversification aspect is, is always a good idea that just, keeps you away from, you know, company-specific risk, uh, depending on what your investment thesis was. And, and again, my area is a little bit more sector-specific or, or, or uh, macro top-down. So the diversification we have seen, uh, for example, the last sell-off that we saw at the beginning of February, uh, you know, correlation went to one um, with a lot of risk assets. So it was more, are you delevering or unlevering or taking risk off? And and in that scenario, it almost didn't matter how diversified you were. I mean, we saw gold move lower. We saw bonds move lower uh, on the first day of the sell-off in February as well. So if you had a, you know, a precious metal stock and bond portfolio on the first day of the sell-off, they were all going down, and you would be, you know, scratching your head, wondering, "Well, I, I built a clear, diversified portfolio. I, I, I should be breaking even in in this sort of event." So, the diversification aspect can be uh, misleading to some degrees, uh, I, I think, and, and I think, you know, as we go into market volatility, like we haven't seen before, just given the amount of money that. Uh, Central banks have have put into the bond market, or in other central banks' case, uh, the stock market directly. 
that, you know, we may not see those historical correlations. And, and as a portfolio manager, we all know we have the disclaimer on all of our product that says, you know, past performance is not a, a measure of what's going to happen going forward. And I think that's a bit of a, a myth of some diversification product is saying, you know, look at what happened in the past. You know, uh, bonds always go up when uh, stocks go down, so therefore you're diversified. And I'm, uh, I'm not sure that that's a, a safe way to be thinking about things going forward. We'll have more with Drew Zimmerman right after the break. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. A work program is planned for our Finland property that contains diamond-bearing kimberlite. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ADD, and the Frankfurt Exchange, symbol 82A1. Please visit our website at arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. Welcome back. We're speaking with Drew Zimmerman. Drew, with the uh, Fed having a meeting coming up shortly, what kind of policies are you expecting from Powell's first meeting? Yeah, we've got the first meeting for Jerome Powell coming up next week. I'm looking for what would be considered a, a hawkish outlook. Uh, I think we're going to see a Fed that, that still uses you know, the, the Fed terminology of, of gradual rate hikes and normalization, uh, quote-unquote. But at the same time, I think we're going to see a Fed that realizes uh, that you know they need to continue to move. And, and to me, I think they will you know, use that gradual language, but at the same time sort of emphasize that that gradual rate means four rate hikes this year. I think we're going to see one uh, every quarter sort of at the end of each quarter. Uh, as the meetings come up. So I, I believe it's going to be taken to be a, a overall sort of hawkish statement, um, but at the same time not uh, you know that far away from the wording that we've been used to, uh, especially not um, in the first meeting of, of Jerome Powell, as, as you don't want to you know scare the market too much. But we did see that when he gave his testimony to uh, Congress that, you know, he had more of his own beliefs and he talked about his views more. So uh, I think it'll be a, a good opportunity to see if he sticks to his views and to see if uh, other members of the FOMC look to his views and say, we agree with that and, and follow in line. Now, there will always be a few that dissent, uh, most likely, you know, Kashkari on the, on the dovish side of things. But uh, at the same time, most do tend to agree, and it is good to show some unity behind a, a new leader. So uh, I am looking forward to be a, a more hawkish statement, um, but at the same time, one that shows some continuity as well. Would Canada be forced to hike interest rates as well if the U.S. puts them up three or four times? No. I... I <laughs> I am I am uh, maybe too bearish on the Canadian dollar right now, and uh, I, I really keep my eye on the interest rate differentials between Canada and, and the United States, um, which are getting much wider, uh, about 47 basis points on the, the two-year level right now. Um, so I, I think Canada has done too much to uh, price in interest rates going forward. Uh, we're still at a roughly uh, 30 to 35 percent chance of a rate hike in April. I mean, we just had a, a speech from Polos yesterday that, that knocked a, a full cent off the Canadian dollar from 78 to 77 cents, and that was largely centered around a, a very cautious tone uh, that he's setting and, and a tone of, you know, we can still do more work going forward without having 
strong inflationary pressures, which would be the pressure on an inflation-mandated central bank like the Bank of Canada to really have to raise rates. And you're right in your question in saying, you know, people seem to think that, you know, if the U.S. is going to raise rates, then Canada will just, you know, follow along behind and, and sort of do as we're told sort of thing. But uh, we've got a, a whole laundry list of problems, uh, I think, in Canada that that really need to be addressed before we can be raising rates. So I think Canada is probably looking at a mid to late summer uh, rate hike at the earliest, uh, and that would be if we started to see uh, some of the data points turn around. I think we're going to have a, a very soft first quarter uh, in Canada, and I, I, I just juxtapose that against the Fed that, as I said before, is, is I think, going to raise rates four times this year. So I see that interest rate differential just growing between uh, Canada and the United States and and the clear underperformance of Canada and, and not just against the U.S. dollar. I mean, if you look against the crosses, uh, whether that's the Australian dollar, the British pound, even the Mexican peso has, has greatly outperformed the Canadian dollar over the last two months. And you can say, well, it's just all trade issues with the United States. But, you know, Mexico is facing that same sort of issue as well. And, and their currency is outperforming the Canadian dollar. So there's a lot more going on with Canada than, than just the U.S. dollar. Um, but I do always argue, of course, that, you know, if the U.S. dollar gets stronger, there's nothing we can do about it in Canada, even if we've got a booming economy. The Canadian dollar will weaken. What problems does Canada have that's driving down the dollar? Um, again, to come back to a, a laundry list, I mean, I clearly always watch the uh, interest rate differential and, and, again, the diverging central bank policy I see coming through the rest of this year will uh, exacerbate that issue. Um, last time we were this wide on interest rates, Canada was, was at 75 cents or lower. Uh, so, again, I think that's a weight we have uh, policy issues around energy exports that are, are really affecting the Canadian dollar. We've got our crude oil trading at a you know twenty five to thirty dollar discount over the last month or so to u s crude, which you know is is a big ex- export for us uh, and really takes a lot out of our economy and and again, we just can't seem to get around to getting more export capacity built. We've got general competitive issues now that the U.S. has changed their tax rates on businesses as well as the deregulation push that Trump has gone through. And we just got through the provincial and federal budgets that there really didn't seem to have any pushback. And we're seeing that in, you know, the foreign direct investment numbers and the CapEx numbers in Canada uh, that, you know, maybe we're just not going to see as much business investment here. We're not as competitive, but... Again, I think you have to look at it and say, you know, if we're not competitive on those marks, then the Canadian dollar is a freely traded currency. It becomes our relief valve, so to speak. So if we have a currency that declines 10, 15, 20 percent, then we become competitive again. And and that's sort of the, the work of a free currency. But again, that means a currency that's going much lower. Do you see the BC NDP government adopting its uh, policy from the 90s, eat the rich? Uh, I, I wouldn't even say that's just in BC. I mean, we, we had Trudeau on, on CNBC this week uh, where he clearly said that they were going to, you know, help the middle class and tax the rich uh, because that's how you help an economy grow. I, I mean, I may get that quote wrong when it comes to the exact wording but to me that was that was the gist of what he was saying um so it, it's definitely a a mindset in canada uh that you know tax rates need to go higher to fund things for other people um and and the tax rates at at the high levels unfortunately do uh you know cause some competitiveness issues um if you're going to be a leader in your field, you're you're likely in the higher tax bracket uh, as well. So it would be you know less advantageous, whether that's BC or Canada as a whole, 
uh, to be located there if, if, if you are really a, a global leader. So you're going to look to be elsewhere. And, and we live in a world now that, you know, travel is relatively inexpensive and quick. And, you know, given the telecommunications that we have, you know, a lot of the time not even necessary. So people are, are more mobile and able to work from anywhere almost, uh, at any other point in time. So, I think we do have some some longer term issues to face there, and and whether it's a, a, a BC NDP policy or a federal liberal policy, uh, I I do think that will be an issue if uh, if we maintain that mindset of, you know, those rich guys need to pay because you know they have so much money. We'll have more with Drew Zimmerman right after this. I'm Brian Fowler, president of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlan District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Drew Zimmerman. Drew, what kind of an impact would a higher U.S. dollar have on the commodity market? The U.S. dollar always uh, is very important to the commodity markets. I mean, it's it's the denominator as we see most commodities priced. So there there is always that. However, I would say in the past uh, two months or several months since really mid December uh, is is sort of the time frame that I'm looking at it to say we had an excessive weakness in the U.S. dollar. And when it was through the holiday period of December, I thought that may just be attributable to light trading through the holidays, so on and so forth. However, that just continued right on in in January. And we saw that the U.S. dollar bottom both at the end of January and middle of February, uh, the recent bottoms anyway. And and through that period, we saw a lot of the commodity markets do better, uh, the precious metals market, the uh, crude market, that sort of thing. But over the past two months, uh, where we've had the U.S. dollar largely in a in a two cent range, sort of between eighty eight and a half and ninety and a half on the dollar index, we've also seen you know gold be in a forty dollar range for the most part. We've seen silver uh, be in a tighter range over the last couple of months. In the last month, you know, crude oil has been in a tighter range. So uh, I really do think that if we were to see a breakout in the dollar one way or the other, um, obviously given my, my view on where the Fed is going and, and where policy is, I, I think the U.S. dollar could strengthen going forward. So if that was to happen, I could see the uh, commodities being vulnerable to a stronger dollar. And I, and I use that term because some of the other drivers that I see that normally influence the uh, gold market, for example, the real rates would dictate that gold should be much lower than where it is right now. But there's been a divergence. And again, I would uh, attribute that to the weakness in the U.S. dollar. So that vulnerability, as I speak of it, is because other drivers are indicating to me that the prices are dislocated. And you look to say, well, why is that? And you come back to an overly weak U.S. dollar. So that vulnerability then provides me with the reasoning to say if we do see the U.S. dollar strengthen, there's not a lot of other supports in some of the markets that I that I see to really hold them up. Um, crude oil, for example, is the same. We, we have ongoing issues between uh, members of OPEC where they think oil prices should be. Iran says they should be at 60. Uh, Saudi thinks they should be closer to 70. You know, at 60 to 65, we see U.S. production continuing to, this week again, just hit new all-time highs uh, on the production level, now the world's second largest uh, crude oil producer. So are we oversupplying the market with, with shale? You know, the speculators have taken on a record long position and maintained that over the last several months. 
so again if prices start to break down there's there's you know market specific uh, drivers in each case that could really see uh, the markets fall and you know a, a catalyst or uh, sort of the, the match in the tinderbox for some of that could be uh, a stronger U.S. dollar. Now, I don't mean to be dramatic when I say a match in the tinderbox. There are levels that you will see support through those, but near term, uh, I'm definitely watching the U.S. dollar closely because I think a, a strong breakout above 91 on the dollar index would indicate that we could see uh, a, a lot more pain coming in some of the commodities. Drew, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks for having me on this week, Jim. My guest has been Drew Zimmerman. He's a portfolio manager at PI Financial in Vancouver. His website, pifinancial.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. You can find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.